Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the September 2021 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of the Black Manifesto from 1969, developed during the National Black Economic Development Conference. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So the Black Manifesto was written in 1969 at the Black Economic Development Conference held in Detroit, Michigan. In 1969, James Foreman, of whom we have done a few audiobooks here on the channel, presented the first draft of this manifesto, and it won about 75% of support from the delegates there. It was later presented to the public in the spring of 1969 at various churches. Basically, this manifesto called for half a billion dollars in reparations from white churches for their participation in slavery and segregation committed against black people in the United States. If you're interested in this topic, the Black Manifesto in general, as well as just some of the social context of the late 1960s in the United States, we have another file going up on the channel today. It's an audiobook of Control, Conflict, and Change, The Underlying Concepts of the Black Manifesto by James Foreman, and I would highly recommend following this up with that. Anyway, let's get into the text of the manifesto. We the black people assembled in Detroit, Michigan for the National Black Economic Development Conference are fully aware that we've been forced to come together because racist white America has exploited our resources, our minds, our bodies, our labor. For centuries, we've been forced to live as colonized people inside the United States, victimized by the most vicious, racist system in the world. We have helped to build the most industrial country in the world. We are therefore demanding of the white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues, which are part and parcel of the system of capitalism, that they begin to pay reparations to black people in this country. We are demanding $500 million from the Christian white churches and the Jewish synagogues. This total comes to $15 per N-word. And yeah, it says the full word, but I'm not even going to quote that. This is a low estimate, for we maintain that there are probably more than 300 million black people in this country. $15 a N-word is not a large sum of money, and we know that the churches and synagogues have a tremendous wealth, and its membership, White America, has profited and still exploits black people. We are also not unaware that the exploitation of colored peoples around the world is aided and abetted by the white Christian churches and synagogues. This demand for $500 million is not an idle resolution or empty words. $15 for every black brother and sister in the United States is only a beginning of the reparations due us as people who have been exploited and degraded, brutalized, killed, and persecuted. Underneath all of this exploitation, the racism of this country has produced a psychological effect upon us that we are beginning to shake off. We're no longer afraid to demand our full rights as a people in this decadent society. We are demanding $500 million to be spent in the following way. 1. We call for the establishment of a southern land bank to help our brothers and sisters who have to leave their land because of racist pressure for people who want to establish cooperative farms but who have no funds. We've seen too many farmers evicted from their homes because they have dared to defy the white racism of this country. We need money for land. We must fight for massive sums of money for this southern land bank. We call for $200 million to implement this program. 2. We call for the establishment of four major publishing and printing industries in the United States to be funded with $10 million each. These publishing houses are to be located in Detroit, Atlanta, Los Angeles, and New York. They will help to generate capital for further cooperative investments in the black community, provide jobs, and an alternative to the white-dominated and controlled printing field. 3. We call for the establishment of four of the most advanced scientific and futuristic audiovisual networks to be located in Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, and Washington, D.C. These TV networks will provide an alternative to the racist propaganda that fills the current television networks. 
Each of these TV networks will be funded by $10 million each. 4. We call for a research skills center, which will provide research on the problems of black people. This center must be funded with no less than $30 million. 3. We call for the establishment of a training center for the teaching of skills in community organization, photography, movie making, television making and repair, radio building and repair, and all other skills needed in communication. This training center shall be funded with no less than $10 million. 6. We recognize the role of the National Welfare Rights Organization and we intend to work with them. We call for $10 million to assist in the organization of welfare recipients. We want to organize the welfare workers in this country so that they may demand more money from the government and better administration of the welfare system of this country. 7. We call for $20 million to establish a national black labor strike and defense fund. This is necessary for the protection of black workers and their families who are fighting racist working conditions in this country. 8. We call for the establishment of the International Black Appeal, IBA. This International Black Appeal will be funded with no less than $20 million. The IBA is charged with producing more capital for the establishment of cooperative businesses in the United States and in Africa, our motherland. The International Black Appeal is one of the most important demands that we are making, for we know that it can generate and raise funds throughout the United States and help our African brothers. The IBA is charged with three functions and shall be headed by James Foreman. One, raising money for the program of the National Black Economic Development Conference. Two, the development of cooperatives in African countries and support of African liberation movements. And three, establishment of a black anti-defamation league, which will protect our African image. Nine. We call for the establishment of a black university to be funded with $130 million to be located in the South. Negotiations are presently underway with the Southern University. Quick comment there. I think it says $130 million. It's a little bit blurry there. 10. We demand that IFCO allocate all unused funds in the planning budget to implement the demands of this conference. In order to win our demands, we are aware that we will have to have massive support. Therefore, one, we call upon all black people throughout the United States to consider themselves as members of the National Black Economic Development Conference and to act in unity to help force the racist white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues to implement these demands. Two, we call upon all the concerned black people across the country to contact black workers, black women, black students, and the black unemployed, community groups, welfare organizations, teachers organizations, church leaders and organizations, explaining how these demands are vital to the black community of the U.S. Pressure by whatever means necessary should be applied to the white power structure of the racist white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues. All black people should act boldly in confronting our white oppressors and demanding this modest reparation of $15 per black man. 3. Delegates and members of the National Black Economic Development Conference are urged to call press conferences in the cities and to attempt to get as many black organizations as possible to support the demands of the conference. The quick use of the press in the local areas will heighten the tension, and these demands must be attempted to be won in a short period of time, although we are prepared for protracted and long-range struggle. 4. We call for the total disruption of selected church-sponsored agencies operating anywhere in the U.S. and the world. Black workers, black women, black students, and the black unemployed are encouraged to seize the offices, telephones, and printing apparatus of all church-sponsored agencies and to hold these in trusteeship until our demands are met. 5. We call upon all delegates and members of the National Black Economic Development Conference to stage sit-in demonstrations at selected black and white churches. This is not to be interpreted as a continuation of the sit-in movement of the early 60s, but we know that active confrontation inside white churches is possible and will strengthen the possibility of meeting our demands. Such confrontation can take the form of reading the black manifesto instead of a sermon or passing it out to church members. The principle of self-defense should be applied if attacked. 
6. On May 4, 1969, or a date thereafter, depending on local conditions, we call upon black people to commence the disruption of the racist churches and synagogues throughout the United States. 7. We call upon IFCO to serve as a central staff to coordinate the mandate of the conference and to reproduce and distribute en masse literature, leaflets, news items, press releases, and other material. 8. We call upon all delegates to find within the white community those forces which will work under the leadership of blacks to implement these demands by whatever means necessary. By taking such actions, white Americans will demonstrate concretely that they are willing to fight the white skin privilege and the white supremacy and racism which has forced us as black people to make these demands. 9. We call upon all white Christians and Jews to practice patience, tolerance, understanding, and nonviolence as they have encouraged, advised, and demanded that we as black people should do throughout our entire enforced slavery in the United States. The true test of their faith and belief in the cross and the words of the prophets will certainly be put to a test as we seek legitimate and extremely modest reparations for our role in developing the industrial base of the Western world through our slave labor. But we are no longer slaves. We're men and women, proud of our African heritage, determined to have our dignity. 10. We are so proud of our African heritage and realize concretely that our struggle is not only to make revolution in the United States, but to protect our brothers and sisters in Africa and to help them rid themselves of racism, capitalism, and imperialism by whatever means necessary, including armed struggle. We are and must be willing to fight the defamation of our African image wherever it rears its ugly head. We are therefore charging the steering committee to create a black anti-defamation league to be funded by money raised from the international black appeal. 11. We fully recognize that revolution in the United States and Africa, our motherland, is more than a one-dimensional operation. It will require the total integration of the political, economic, and military components, and therefore, we call upon all our brothers and sisters who have acquired training and expertise in the fields of engineering, electronics, research, community organization, physics, biology, chemistry, mathematics, medicine, military science, and warfare to assist the National Black Economic Development Conference in the implementation of its program. 12. To implement these demands, we must have a fearless leadership. We must have a leadership which is willing to battle the church establishment to implement these demands. To win our demands, we will have to declare war on the white Christian churches and synagogues, and this means that we may have to fight the total government structure of this country. Let no one here think that these demands will be met by our mere stating them. For the sake of the churches and synagogues, we hope that they have the wisdom to understand that these demands are modest and reasonable. But if the white Christians and Jews are not willing to meet our demands through peace and goodwill, then we declare war and we are prepared to fight by whatever means necessary. We are, therefore, proposing the election of the following steering committee. Then there's a list of names. Lucius Walker, Rennie Freeman, Luke Tripp, Howard Fuller, James Foreman, John Watson, Dan Aldridge, John Williams, Ken Cockrell, Chuck Wooten, Fanny Lou Hamer, Julian Bond, Mark Comfort, Earl Allen, Robert Brown, Vincent Harding, Mike Hamlin, Len Holt, Peter Bernard, Michael Wright, Muhammad Kenyatta, Mel Jackson, Howard Moore, and Harold Holmes. Brothers and sisters, we are no longer shuffling our feet and scratching our heads. We are tall, black, and proud. And we say to the white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues, to the government of this country, and to all the white racist imperialists who compose it, there is only one thing left that you can do to further degrade black people, and that is to kill us. But we've been dying too long for this country. We've died in every war. We're dying in Vietnam today, fighting the wrong enemy. The new black man wants to live, and to live means that we must not become static or merely believe in self-defense. We must boldly go out and attack the white Western world at its power centers. The white Christian churches are another form of government in this country, and they are used by the government of this country to exploit the people of Latin America, Asia, and Africa. But the day is soon coming to an end. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the demands we make upon the white Christian churches and the Jewish synagogues 
are small demands. They represent $15 per black person in these United States. We can legitimately demand this from the church power structure. We must demand more from the U.S. government. But to win our demands from the church, which is linked up with the U.S. government, we must not forget that it will ultimately be by force and power that we will win. We are not threatening the churches. We are saying that we know the churches came with the military might of the colonizers and have been sustained by the military might of the colonizers. Hence, if the churches in colonial territories were established by military might, we know deep within our hearts that we must be prepared to use force to get our demands. We're not saying that this is the road we want to take. It is not. But let us be very clear that we are not opposed to force, and we're not opposed to violence. We were captured in Africa by violence. We were kept in bondage and political servitude, and forced to work as slaves by the military machinery and the Christian church working hand in hand. We recognize that, in issuing this manifesto, we must prepare for a long-range educational campaign in all communities of this country, but we know that the Christian churches have contributed to our oppression in white America. We do not intend to abuse our black brothers and sisters in black churches who have uncritically accepted Christianity. We want them to understand how the racist white Christian church, with its hypocritical declarations and doctrines of brotherhood, has abused our trust and faith. An attack on the religious beliefs of black people is not our major objective, even though we know that we were not Christians when we were brought to this country, but that Christianity was used to help enslave us. Our objective in issuing this manifesto is to force the racist white Christian church to begin the payment of reparations which are due to all black people, not only by the church, but also by private business and the U.S. government. We see this focus on the Christian church as an effort around which all black people can unite. Our demands are negotiable, but they cannot be minimized. They can only be increased, and the church is asked to come up with larger sums of money than we are asking. Our slogans are, all roads must lead to revolution, unite with whomever you can unite, neutralize wherever possible, fight our enemies relentlessly, victory to the people, life and good health to mankind, resistance to domination by the white Christian churches and the Jewish synagogues, revolutionary black power, we shall win without a doubt. And that's the end of the audiobook. So this was the Black Manifesto, 1969. What do you think? Leave a comment below. Um, the only thing that's coming to mind in particular that I'd like to add to this discussion is when we try to understand the context, for example, of the drug war, the war on drugs. This was a piece of policy, the drug war, which was proposed by right-wing politicians and policymakers in the Nixon administration, in particular, this was discussed as a way of imprisoning political opponents, you know, people who wanted this kind of change in the United States. And they found that criminalizing, you know, various activities that working class people engage in, particularly, you know, if they could refine it by aggrieved ethnic minority complaints, then they could have a way to lock up anybody they didn't feel like listening to. And that's pretty much the story of the war on drugs. So when we look at the Black Manifesto, this is one example of oppressed people in the United States starting to assert rights and making demands. And it did really shake the power structure. And you know, this was one of the reasons for the neoliberal consensus, the conservative backlash that we're still living through to this day. It may be that that is starting to break up or rather that we're starting to mount some really concerted opposition to it, naming it, talking about it in everyday life for more and more people. But anyway, I'll leave you with that thought for now. Thanks for watching. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to support, get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash Socialism for All. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Otherwise, if you'd like to help out without a donation, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting all help to boost the channel in the YouTube algorithm. So thanks for that if you do that. Whatever it is that you do online and in your community to advance the conversation about socialism, thanks for doing it, and we will catch you in the next video.